Okay, let's get started. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to the second part of the Time Loop Acceler GSK tutorial. This is the hands-on session, and we'll be going through some fun exercises today. Um, hopefully, most of you will be able to uh, follow along with us and, um, and ask questions. Okay, so um, the first and most important thing is uh, these resources. Uh, we've got a, um, a tutorial website uh, which has all of the resources you should need, uh, including the Docker, which, which contains an image of everything you'll need to run the exercises in this session. Um, and you'll, you'll see uh, instructions to install the Docker. And for some reason, if you don't have, um, if you cannot install Docker on your machine, there's instructions to do a uh, native install as well. Uh, we will be spending some time on introductory remarks. And if you, so if you haven't installed the infrastructure so far, uh, please do so now. It, the entire session will be a lot more productive if you're actually able to follow along uh, as we walk through the exercises. But if you can't, that's fine too. We'll, um, uh, you know, we'll try to make it, we'll try to communicate as much as possible. Um, okay, uh, but before we get started, um, we'd like to do a couple of polls. Um, the first poll is, um, how many people watched the video? And the second poll is, were you able to set up the infrastructure? Um, and if you had any issues setting up the infrastructure. You should be able to see the poll icon um, as part of the Zoom interface and when you... When you see it, please, uh, please vote. Okay, we've only received five uh, votes so far from uh, 40 plus participants, so please, please chime in. Okay, let's move on. Um, we've, got, we've got a good distribution of people who watched, um, who watched the video. Almost everybody watched uh, at least some part of the video. And um, some fraction of people, a good fraction of people also were able to set up the infrastructure, although we do have a few cases that didn't have time. Um, so again, once again, Please visit the website. You will see instructions to set up the infrastructure either using Docker or natively. Even the native process is fairly streamlined. If you have a bare uh, Ubuntu or Debian-based system, you should be able to install everything in um, five to 10 minutes if you just follow the instructions blindly. Right? There, there's, it's almost like a script. Okay, um, with, uh, with that out of the way, um, let's, let's dive into some introductory remarks. So what, uh, oh, by the way, as we go through these introductory slides, you'll see on the top of the slide there, you still have a pointer to the website um, for, for people coming in. All right, so what these tools are trying to do is basically um, exploit reuse. If you've seen the video, you've already seen some of this. This is just a quick recap. So, uh, so we're trying to exploit reuse and find out different ways in which um, uh, what we call algorithmic reuse, which for example, for a convolutional layer is your sliding window convolutional reuse, input and output activation reuse, batch reuse, etc. cetera. Uh, how do these forms of algorithmic reuse map onto forms of hardware reuse uh, and forms of hardware reuse include temporal reuse where you fetch things from um, a, a, a far away expensive storage unit to a nearby cheaper storage unit 
uh, as well as uh, things like multicast and forwarding data between uh, neighboring units. So what are the various ways to do that? And it so happens that if you have uh, a flexible architecture, and the flexible doesn't mean it has to be completely programmable, you may have flexible state machines on your hardware, um, even that flexibility exposes uh, uh, a space of alternative mappings. And there could be millions of them depending on the uh, capabilities of the hardware. And it so happens that that space is actually fairly interesting. Uh, we uh, walk through uh, this in the video. This is a histogram of, um, uh, of the energy efficiency of various mappings of a single problem or single workload on a specific architecture. And uh, you know, there's a significant spread in uh, energy efficiency, and um, the set of optimal mappings is actually fairly small. In fact, one of them is strictly uh, optimal among 480,000 mappings in this example. And so that motivates the reason for a mapper, right? If you're trying to model the execution of a workload on an architecture, you need a mapper. Uh, because without a mapping, you're not modeling the workload. You, you, know, you need to model a particular execution of the workload. That's why you need a mapper. And uh, there's uh, the um, sort of the, the, the flip side of that is that a mapper also needs a good cost model because a mapper is typically uh, a search heuristic that walks through the space of mappings. And uh, it needs it needs a way to find out if a mapping is good or not. And that's what our cost model is for. And so the, you know, the mapper and a model have a um, synergistic relationship. And that's what uh, this infrastructure, time loop and XLRG is, um, uh, is designed for. Uh, it's got a mapper component and a model component. Uh, the model component itself is composed of basically three stages of operation. There's a tile analysis stage, a microarchitectural model, and then XLRG, which forms the, the, the foundation that, of, of the technology model. Um, and uh, so the, the objective of the model is to model a variety of uh, DNN accelerators. And the objective of the mapper is to be able to map um, every single uh, architecture that the model can model. Uh, and so together, uh, they form uh, a set of tools for evaluation, mapping, and architectural design space exploration of uh, these kind of accelerators. Um, okay, so we're going to take a, uh, um, a pause and go through some questions that people asked on WOVA. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, please also feel free to ask questions through Zoom. Uh, and after I'm done with the over questions, we'll go through a couple of the uh, of the Zoom questions as well. Uh, so, uh, so please go ahead and ask those questions. Okay. So, um, uh, one of the one of the most common questions that uh, we get is, can time loop and XLRG be applied or or be used for evaluating? Um, an accelerator X, right? And that accelerator X may have some unique attributes such as it may have a unique organization or it may have a, a unique underlying technology, such as, you know, we've got a question about a DRAM-based PIM accelerator. Uh, we've got a question about um, using an FPGA as a substrate for mapping DNN computations. And the question is, can the infrastructure be used to, uh, to model those? So the answer is, um, you have to ask yourself, um, can the organization uh, be modeled in time loop and XLRG, and then can the um, can the underlying technology structures uh, can they be uh, modeled uh, in XLRG, right? And the answer is often uh, uh, is in general it's yes, but you have to be careful in this in describe in being in uh, in describing both the organization as well as the attributes of the underlying technology, right? So. Um, I'll, I'll actually um, turn it over to Nelly because the uh, the, uh, the the second half of the question is more uh, is more interesting because you need to be able to uh, describe the attributes of the building blocks 
of a DRAM-based PIM or um, an FPGA substrate such as DRAMs, et cetera, as an Xenergy plugin? And so I'll, I'll let Nelly answer uh, that half of the question. Yeah, so as Anshu has mentioned, uh, one important aspect is whether we can have the architecture specification specify your architecture. Mm -hmm. And the second uh, part is, can we model the underlying technology? So currently, uh, XRV does have some open source energy estimation plugin, but they are mostly designed for the conventional CMOS digital designs. So if you are interested in using either, uh, for example, DRAM-based processing memory accelerator or uh, FPGA-based designs, uh, the, the most important thing that you want to do is create your own database for describing the energy consumption of these basic building blocks that are involved in such designs. So XRG does provide a very flexible interface for you to plug in your own data, which will just be a set of simple CSV tables that contain the energy consumption or area consumption of your basic building blocks. And later in the accelerator exercises, I'm going to show a, a simple example of how can we insert our own tables to the accelerator infrastructure so that uh, XRG is able to take in the energy consumption of these uh, building blocks that are necessary for your architecture. And by that, I'm going to show an example of using memory store based architecture and performing energy modeling on that. Um, I guess I'll continue to another question that's related to Axology, which is asking, does Axology model wire length uh, um, and does it model networks? So this is related to the architecture specification of the architecture. So currently the uh, framework allows you to specify the network but you do need to specify the wire length of your network. Mm -hmm. So in this case, you probably will need to add the wire length, the router, and whatever is needed for your network for mm -hmm. the entire time loop and XRG system to evaluate energy consumption of the mm -hmm. wires and the other components in the network. So in the examples, in the Iris example, we actually have some network specification there um, that can be used as an example for guiding you for constructing such a network. Um, and there is also a question asking about the simulators that can be used for the XLRG tool uh, basically can be integrated into XLRG and generate the energy estimation. So theoretically, XLRG is able to connect with any type of simulators um, as long as the simulator's outputs action count that has, uh, as long as the simulator output action count that has the uh, correct format. So in this case, time loop is an example simulator that's used for um, DN accelerators, but also we can connect Gem5, which is used for CPUs or any other, uh, or DRAM sim. I think a lot of people have been mentioning this in the conference chat. So all of these simulators can be connected to Axology as long as you uh, tune the output format so that Axology is able to understand the output description. Um, so that would be my answer to that question. Um, so I'll hand it to Anshu to answer the time loop related question about the latency. Yeah, thank, thank you, Nelly. Um, so the next question is, uh, is it possible to extend time loop in order to model dynamic latency, for example, due to DRAM row buffer locality or bus contention? So that, that this is really an excellent question. It's a deep question. The, so the answer is you have to think about how time loop works. We, uh, we've set, the, the way we design time loop is that it's set, the model part of time loop is that it's separated into a tile analysis component and a microarchitecture model component, as you can see on this slide. And the interface between the two components is this compact representation of data movement uh, across the chip, uh, across the architecture, right? Um, and so if you're trying to do something more dynamic, um, so you'll have to ask, what, how would these two components change? Um, so uh, what I would say is that um, you would want to do it probably stochastically, because remember, this is, this, the, the idea is for this to be a fast analytical model, right? You don't want to run a, um, a cycle accurate tile, tile analysis. You can, you can still use the interfaces to set up a, sort of a very detailed cycle level tile analysis and a detailed cycle accurate microarchitecture model, but then it's very unlikely that you'll be able to use it in loop uh, in, a, 
as a cost model for the mapper, right? So uh, if you want to model uh, sort of dynamic effects, the best way to do it would be stochastically. And so uh, the tile analysis would probably want to calculate, uh, collect some statistics on the dynamic behavior of workloads um, and pass it on to the microarchitecture model which uses some sort of a stochastic analysis to, to determine um, uh, contention and things like that. So I think it's certainly possible. It would be an interesting exercise to actually go ahead and, uh, and do it. Um, then uh, we've got a um, couple more questions on WOVA, uh, our workloads. Which, by the way, we encourage people to please ask their questions on Zoom because after this session, we will not be looking at WOVA anymore. Um, uh, so please ask them on Zoom and we'll, we'll try to uh, funnel those questions in. Okay, so are, are workload specs available for well-known DNN benchmarks? Uh, the answer is we, we tend to use um, DeepBench. DeepBench is a very nice uh, uh, table-based representation of a large number of workloads. Uh, we don't include DeepBench in the time loop accelerity distribution because it's uh, uh, for, for license reasons. However, we have a script uh, that can that's provided as part of the time loop distribution. If you just download the, uh, the, the DeepBench data, you should be able to do some uh, massaging on the DeepBench data and then use the uh, available scripts to use, uh, uh, to use those workloads uh, without much work. Um, and um, uh, one last question, what technology node energy libraries would be open source? Uh, any modern processes, that, that's, that's very hard, right? Because technology node uh, data is very tightly controlled by corporations. Uh, there's uh, probably some data that, uh, um, that, that, uh, that is available out in the open and whenever such data is available, uh, you can package it up as an Excel energy plugin. We'll try to do some of that and we invite others to do it as well. Um, but, uh, you know, it's especially for the modern process, it's, uh, processes, it's likely that th that data is gonna be um, tightly controlled. Um, okay, uh, Nali, do you want to add to that? Um, I think that's a great answer. So basically, for uh, we can only integrate the open source data into XRG and time loop for open source plugin. So we will be watching at what new data is coming out, but it will be also encouraging for you to package your own uh, data tables or plugin to support the system. Uh, and so, uh, Joel, yeah, do, do we have any questions that came in? Yes, um, there are some questions that came in. Um, uh, I wanted to ex extend one of the answers uh, about, you know, generating workloads that um, we used this uh, combination of tools, Time Loop and Accelergy, uh, for class projects this past semester. And there were 50 plus students who were using it. And one of the, actually a couple of the projects um, included tools that, that were used to convert uh, workloads in ONNX or in TensorFlow into inputs that could be used by, by Time Loop and Accelergy. And we'll be um, releasing those tools and including them in the distribution so people can easily generate more workloads. Oh, just quick clarification from PyTorch, I think it was too. Oh, right. Right. Uh, that's right. It was Py PyTorch, not TensorFlow. I said the wrong thing. Thank you. Um, uh, there were a couple of questions that came in on the Zoom. Uh, one of them says, what are the requirements for the, quote, arch spec attributes? Is it higher level values such as max DRAM bandwidth, max compute throughput, or does it go into more detail? Okay. So that, so the answer to that depends on the specific uh, component, right? Whether it's a primitive component or a compound component, Nelly will be talking more about that. And uh, because this is a plugin and a plugin based and modular system, uh, you, uh, each component has its own set of attributes, right? So what we, what we try to do uh, as part of the evolving library of components is to try to uh, provide a rich library uh, and, um, but every component in the library can, has, you know, you, you, you can have a DRAM module with a, di with a different fidelity level and you can have a different DRAM model, module with a different fidelity level, right? And so it, 
right now, I believe the, the DRAM module that we're providing today, it has these higher level values, right? The, the model is, uh, is more abstract. Uh, so it's got you know, a, a maximum amount of bandwidth, et cetera. Um, but it is always possible to add um, components with more fidelity. Uh, so that's, that's on the accelerity side. And then on the time loop side, the question would be, okay, can time loops microarchitecture model, can it tap into the available fidelity and what kinds of, um, uh, how does it use the available fidelity in the component description? Uh, right now, time loops model is basically a, a throughput based model. So you may have a component that has a ton of fidelity, uh, but it, time loop may not actually use all of that fidelity. Uh, and that, that again, the, you know, the fidelity improvements are again an ongoing process. We try to keep adding uh, more and more sophistication into them uh, to add more fidelity, but you know, hopefully not at the cost of execution time because that's something that's really important because the model runs in loop with the mapper. So, so I think, I, I, I guess, I think that the question might also be asking something at the higher level which is they asked about the arch spec, which is what is the topology and what is the topology of the system and what are the what are what are the what are the uh, degree of freedom in the specification of the topology of the system both for time loop and then for Accelergy? Okay. So if, it, if, if the question is on topology, then the answer is the topology is basically a tree-based template. And as long as you describe things in that tree-based template, you can, the tree can have an unlimited number of levels uh, until you run out of memory in the host system and the simulation crashes. <laughs> but hopefully, hopefully you're not describing a hardware that, that, that's that complicated. Um, but you can have an, uh, an unrestricted number of, number of levels and an unrestricted number of uh, instances at each level. Uh, so it's a fairly, uh, uh, gen generic uh, template. And then within each of the nodes in that template, you have a class and a set of attributes for that class. And so but the part of the question that I was answering before was about this, uh, the attributes of that class, right? And, and that's, that, that depends on the, uh, on the specific uh, component that you're instantiating. And time loop, time, time loop allows you to specify, you know, a certain set of types of components in that tree. Nelly, do you want to describe what Accelergy can do? So Accelergy is very flexible in terms of what components you want to have inside the architecture and uh, what properties your component uh, has associated with. So um, uh, you can have user-defined components that are either used for storage or used for compute, but the, uh, the underlying implementation of the component can be specific to your design. And Axology will be able to understand all these lower-level implementation of your component. Um, and uh, I guess in terms of energy estimation point of view, it's able to decompose your component into lower level building blocks and perform the estimation. Um, on, the other, on the time loop side, there is, I guess, uh, the high level types of components, storage and compute. Um, and on the accelerator side, you can actually specify your storage to be uh, design specific and your compute unit to be design specific. So we'll be going over some examples to show how you can use Axology, uh to actually specify your design specific components. On the uh, uh, on a similar vein, the next question was: When you say that it can accelerate, um, sorry, that it can integrate with Gem Five or Aladdin, um, is it possible to mention the commit which is tested? Or rather, describe what you mean by that integration. Um, so um, we haven't released public commits for Gem5 connection with Axelergy, uh, but we are definitely working on it. Um, so I guess the high level idea is 
uh, in order to connect a simulator with the XRG tool, uh, the only requirement is basically your action counts output have the same format as XRG requires. So we will definitely release uh, release the commit for Gem5 connection when it's ready, but currently we do only have open source uh, version for time loop and XRG connection, not other simulators. Um, and there was there was another part of that, um, uh, which is which is the connection to Aladdin. What what does that mean? Um, so Aladdin is is more for the accelerator uh, modeling. We haven't really looked into the connection between XRG and Aladdin, but I believe with some instrumentation into the performance modeling inside Aladdin, we're able to connect the two tools uh, to generate a more accurate energy estimation of uh, the accelerators that can be modeled by Aladdin. Yeah, so what do you, what, I, I, I'm interpreting the question to be, what do you mean that Aladdin is integrated with Accelergy? Um, I think there are two, two aspects of the Aladdin tool. One is the performance modeling of the accelerator, accelerator and the other is the way it estimates energy. So the integrated part is uh, we have integrated the open source data inside Aladdin for estimating uh, energy consumption of the 45 nanometer components as a plugin. Uh, but for the performance modeling part, we did not integrate that connection. Okay. Um, and there is, and, and there is one other question. Um, it says the tools need energy of different components as inputs. Is there any plan to release energy numbers of various components at different tech nodes? Um, so the, the current open source tools um, had, so it has Cacti integrated, which is the SRAM or cache energy estimation tool that is able to in, uh, estimate different technology nodes. Um, and we currently only have 45 nanometer estimations for the arithmetic units. Um, uh, I guess, as we have mentioned earlier, if there is any new technology node coming up um, that's open source data, we can definitely integrate that into the open source framework as a new plugin. Uh, but other than that, currently, we don't have any other open source uh, plugin for the other technologies. Right, maybe I can add to that. I think, you know, the goal of this is kind of to bridge various different communities. And so uh, folks who have new, you know, who are doing research and developing new technology nodes or doing new devices and circuits, um, we're encouraging those folks to build plugins so that architects can also use this tool to explore that space. Um, and so we're also hoping that folks who build more, you know, different components and different plugins for their particular designs can also um, provide that for um, folks who are working on new devices, new plugins to get a kind of an architecture level ability to evaluate their components as well. So this is really a tool that we're hoping will bridge various communities. And so we hope that in the future there will be um, even more different technology nodes that are available, even emerging technology nodes. And similarly, we hope that there'll be a lot of different architectures that people also um, demonstrate with this tool, which will be also accessible to uh, various researchers. If I could add one more thing. I, what's sort of implicit here is that the objective of the tool was to make it easy to add new technology, information about new technologies in the form of plugins. Some of those plugins will, by their very nature, have to be proprietary or maybe used by a small group, either in industry or in academia, because they have proprietary information that they don't want to share. But we hope that other information that is um, able to be shared will be released as an open source plugin that other people will be able to take advantage of. And that was the last question we have at the moment. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Joel. Uh, oh, by the way, I'm, I'm sorry. I forgot to do, I forgot to introduce everyone in the beginning. Uh, we, th that was uh, Joel Emmer speaking. He uh, is a 
um, senior distinguished research scientist at NVIDIA and a uh, professor at MIT. Uh, we've got uh, Professor Vivinzi uh, from uh, MIT, and uh, the two presenters today are uh, Nelly Wu, uh, a PhD student at MIT, and myself. I work at NVIDIA. My name is Anshu Parashar. And in the background, we have Poan Zai, who also works at NVIDIA, who's um, helping us with all of the background things, making sure things go smoothly. Okay, so this is a good time to dive into the first uh, exercise. I'll skip this slide. I think we covered most of the motivation behind why things are interesting. Okay, um, so the first part of time loop we'll be covering is time loop, what we call time loop dash model. Okay, and uh, the idea is we're going to be skipping the mapper and just directly using the model. And to fire the model, we need to give it three inputs. We need to give it a problem, which is what is the workload that uh, it's evaluating. We need to give it an architecture, of course, which is what is the architecture you're uh, modeling. And uh, we need to give it a mapping because we're not using the mapper. So um, as a user, we need to hand provide a mapping. So let's go through how we would describe these three. Um, so the first exercise is really, really simple. It's a, 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 it's a CONV1D problem, uh, which it can be represented as a loop nest with uh, two loops. Uh, one going over P, which is going over the output activation dimensions, another going over R, which is going through the weight dimensions, and, uh, and then the input activation dimensions is derived as a function of these two, uh, and this is the uh, map operation you will be performing in the body of the loop. Uh, now, to represent that uh, in time loop, you're going to be thinking about uh, what we call the operation space, and the operation space in this picture is this rectangle, and this it's basically a 2D, uh, uh, it's, it's this 2D structure, 2D array. Uh, the idea here is that every point in this array represents a single MAC operation. That's why it's the operation space. Uh, a lot of compiler people also call it the iteration space. Um, and uh, so the next thing you want to think about is these data spaces, which is basically the tensors that are touched as you walk through this, uh, the, the space of this workload. And the last thing you want to think about is these projections. So how does a point in the operation space project onto uh, points in the three data spaces? And uh, these projections are basically nothing but the indexing expressions that you see in the loop nest space representation. And so the way you uh, represent that today in time loop is, um, is you start out with this, uh, uh, so the, er, everything in time loop and Accelerator uses YAML, uh, YAML for specification. So there's a key called problem. Within that key, you've got a shape which describes the shape, overall shape of the problem and an instance which instantiates a particular uh, a workload. Uh, and so within the, uh, within the shape, uh, you're basically describing the two dimensions R and P, you're describing the data spaces, and then you're describing the projections of the operation space onto the data space. Uh, the, the, the reason for this nesting is that um, we, we, today we don't have a parser that can parse in an indexing expression and, uh, and form the ASD uh, and, and, uh, and digest the ASD. Someday we may write that parser, we don't have it today. And so basically what you're doing is um, you're expressing the indexing expressions as a sum of products form, okay? And uh, so, the, um, so this list, well, the fir first of all, every entry in this list corresponds to uh, a dimension of the tensor. So these three tensors in this example have exactly one dimension. And that's why you just have one entry in this list, one entry in this list, one entry in this list, right? Now, within each of these list entries, now you're trying to describe the indexing expression in SOP form, okay? So SOP, again, is basically a, a list of lists. That's how time loop understands things. And so how many terms are there in each of these lists? There's exactly one term in this list, one term in this list, and there's two terms in this list. And that's why you've got one term, which is basically just R, you've got one time, which is just P, and you've got two terms, which is P plus R. That's what this represents. And then, um, then you're, you're described the product that goes into each term. 
and the product here there's no product going on here it's just p and that's why it, you know each element is is just p later on when we go to a more complex problem where we bring in stride and dilation you'll see the uh, the product actually being expressed uh, as part of this list okay so very simple problem um, and similarly we have a very simple architecture we've got one buffer one mac um, and to represent that we write this yaml tree uh, which um, which which basically uh, is you know you, you, you describe uh, uh, a pe and within each pe you have these two local uh, nodes uh, you've got a node called a buffer uh, which is a class SRAM. Uh, this class is important because the attributes here correspond to the specific class. Uh, so when time loop probes Accelergy, it will be passing the, this class and these attributes down to Accelergy, and Accelergy will return uh, the uh, what's called the energy reference table, and you'll see that in the Accelergy part of the presentation later, uh, that basically says, okay, for this class of element, uh, the uh, the uh, the access cost for access is going to be so and so, and time loop uses that to derive the overall uh, energy statistics. Okay. Similarly, you've got the int map. Now, notice this is this is a nuance, but it's an important nuance. Um, these two buffer and map are at the same level of the subtree. Okay. So, uh, however the order in which you describe them is important uh, buffer describing buffer before describing map actually sets up this picture here where you've got an outer level which is buffer and an inner level which is mac so for example if you were describing a uh, a three level architecture um, you could describe it as another section of a tree Right? You could nest the tree even further with more subtree nodes, but you could also describe it as a straight up stack. Right? So you can have you know, large buffer, small buffer, Mac as a stack, and uh, that would also work. So, so the order in which you describe these, uh, these local elements is important. Okay, so we've got an architecture and a workload. Now we need to describe a mapping. And uh, uh, the mapping here is basically just describing the order in which, or the schedule in which the buffer delivers um, uh, uh, sort of operands to the map, right? And, and it's just a loop nest. Um, and it, it's, it's basically our entire loop nest because this is one level, the, the mapping sort of becomes very, very trivial. And, um, and so, um, so you describe this loop nest and you, you, you want to be able to describe this loop nest and again we use yaml to describe it and uh, what you see is you use this key called mapping um, nominally in time loop whenever you're describing the movement of data between two nodes you attach a target that's the parent node or the source node for that data so in this case the target is the buffer and this is a um, uh, this is a, uh, a temporal type uh, mapping uh, directive. We'll talk about different kinds of mapping directives later on. And you're setting up basically the factors of the loopness and the permutation, uh, which is, uh, you know, R is the inner loop and P is the outer loop, okay? And, um, and so th this YAML is basically trying to capture this loopness. That's it, nothing else. Okay, so, Let's now jump to uh, the, uh, the, the, the exercise itself and follow the instructions in the readme. And specifically, the readme I am talking about is the readme that's part of this re repository, time loop dash accelergy dash exercises. Um, within that, we're going to go into exercises, time loop, and then zero, zero, model, conv one d one level. OK? And the, this text is basically just um, um, a recap of what I covered in the slides. Uh, we already have pre-populated YAML files for the architecture, the problem, and the map. And you can just uh, send these into time loop model. It's important to invoke time loop model as opposed to time loop mapper, which we'll be invoking later. Okay. Uh, and uh, so let's run that exercise. What we're going to do is, uh, 
uh, Nelly, I'm going to ask you to run the, the, the slides for me. And we're not, I'm not going to go through the, uh, uh, I'm not going to try to run the exercises myself, uh, but I'm trying to give, I'm going to try and give as precise instructions as possible. And if people have questions, then, uh, then please ask. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to stop sharing and ask uh, Nelly to share. Nelly, can you please bring up yeah, one second? Uh, while we're doing that, uh, let's have some questions. Uh, are there any questions about exercise zero? Uh, were people able to run it? Were there any uh, challenges running it? Okay, um, if there's no question, then uh, let's move forward. And Ali, can you move on to the next slide? Okay, so what you'll see, um, no, let's go back. Um, yeah, so hopefully you saw um, something like uh, what, what this slide is showing, which is a, um, uh, oh, sorry. You would, see, you would see something on the console and then uh, it's time to put dump out a bunch of output files, including a .map.txt, which is a representation of the uh, mapping that you are intending, uh, uh, plus some additional useful information. For example, where you see weights three inputs 18 output 16, that's a description of the tile size at each of the uh, 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 at each of the buffer levels uh, occupied by each of the tensors, and then you'll also see a stats file, and the stats file is basically broken up into multiple sections. There's a section for uh, storage and arithmetic units, there's a section for the networks, uh, and and then there's going to be a subsection for each storage uh, or arithmetic level. Okay, and you're going to see some uh, uh, energy area and tons and tons of statistics. Now, some of the statistics are zero here. Don't worry about that. It's just as a result of the, the, you know, the specific plugin we're using. It's not a, you know, it's not a, it's not a bug or anything. Okay, uh, now let's move on to the next slide. Um, um, by the way, if, in at leisure, please go through the, uh, the specific instructions in the readme.md for each uh, exercise. There's a ton of useful uh, information there, I think that you should look for. So for example, in exercise zero, which is really, really trivial, there's still something interesting there. So for example, the, the number of fills of the buffer versus the number of reads of the buffer, there's a difference between those numbers and why, why is that? Uh, you, you, you should see some of that. Okay, exercise uh, one, this is the real exercise. Let's move on to a more sophisticated architecture, which uh, is now a two level architecture with a, me uh, with a memory uh, buffer and a, a Mac unit. Now you can click. Um, and uh, here, this is being represented by adding another level to the tree, right? No, nothing uh, dramatically uh, different. It's just the DRAM level that got added to the top uh, along with some attributes of that DRAM. Okay, move on to the next slide. Um, so the mapping for this is, good, is now more interesting because you now have to describe the data movement from DRAM into the buffer and from the buffer uh, into, into the map. And for that, you basically have uh, two loop nests. Uh, and uh, what, what we do is we call this a, uh, the, the, the nominal or the canonical representation of a mapping. Uh, we basically spell out uh, and, and write a loop for each dimension in the problem at each level uh, of the mapping. So at, from the buffer to the Mac, we write a loop for R and P. And from the DRAM to the buffer, we write a loop for R and P. Uh, but this is, we're trying to represent this weight stationary mapping. And so the loop for R is grayed out and the loop for P in, in the uh, inner nest and the loop for P is grayed out in the outer nest. Now let's look at this table below, right? Um, so this is a weight stationary uh, loop nest. So what it's trying to do is it's trying to grab a weight, hold it in the buffer, and apply that weight to uh, a, a certain number of inputs and output activations, uh, right? So, um, so uh, if you think about it, the number of inputs and outputs that you will be storing at the buffer um, is, is, is described in the first row of this table. Okay, so you hold one weight, P inputs and P outputs. 
Uh, and, and the reason it's P inputs is because you've got sort of this sliding window of P inputs. And as you move the weight next weight over, you'll have uh, the next batch of P inputs and the next batch of P inputs. Um, if you think about the number of uh, main memory accesses, it's basically the algorithmic minimum, right? This is, this is the, um, the, this is how many accesses you're going to have. This is how many accesses you had to have had uh, because you needed to fetch everything from memory. And the number of buffer accesses is, is this. It's because you're running PR, um, uh, upper, uh, you're running P, P times R max. And uh, for each Mac, you're going to be fetching the operands from the buffer. That's just how we designed the architecture. And that's why this is the number of accesses. Uh, OK, so uh, to represent this uh, mapping, uh, you, you're, you're basically representing both halves of this loopness. Right? R equals 3, P equals 1 uh, in the outer half, and R equals 1, P equals 16 in the inner half. Um, OK, let's move on. Ne next slide. Um, this is a slightly different mapping. This is an output stationary mapping. And so what you'll see is that on the left-hand side, in the, uh, we've basically flipped the P and R uh, uh, loops. And so you're going over R as you stay in the buffer. And then uh, on the outer section, you're going over P. And so if you look at the table, uh, you're, you're, you're going to see a different set of buffer occupancy numbers. and it, uh, but the uh, buffer accesses and the main memory accesses are exactly identical. Um, OK, and uh, just like the previous weight stationary example, the, in the output stationary example, the, the number of uh, the, the mapping is very, very uh, similar. You just flip the R and the P uh, factors. OK, let's uh, move on. All right. So uh, uh, actually, sorry to interrupt. So yep. Alon has a um, terminal that he can display with, with. Um, yeah. How about I will share the screen and you will comment what I do. Okay. Okay. And Nelly, what one? Whenever you you reach the slide, just stop sharing and I will grab the the monitor. All right, Anshu, just let me know what to do. Yeah. Okay, Juan, can you can you run the weight stationary mapping? Okay, and uh, Juan, I can't see your whole screen. So things are getting cropped. Oh yeah, now I can see the Docker prompt. Yep. Uh, yeah, just run the weight stationary mapping. Okay, uh, copy or keep a backup of the stats file. And run now run the output stationary mapping. Okay, so what we're seeing here is that there is no difference between the energy efficiency of the weight stationary and the output stationary mapping. Uh, why is that? Uh, the answer is that the, if you go back to the tables that, uh, that Nelly was showing uh, on our slides, uh, Nelly, you don't, you, you don't have to bring it up, it's, it's fine. Uh, we'll, um, what you'll see is that basically all your operands are coming from the buffer anyway. And so the number of buffer accesses is actually identical. Um, and then if you think of the data movement between the, the DRAM and the buffer, that's also identical because they're both fetching the same algorithmic minimum number of um, operands. Uh, and so the, uh, the energy profile is actually identical. So, so you may ask, huh, that's interesting. So the, the data flow or the, the change in mapping actually didn't have any uh, impact. Why is that? Well, okay, we're going we're gonna to make it more interesting uh, really quickly. So Juan, can you open up the problem specification? Okay, convondi.prob.yaml. 
and change um, P16 to P1920. So we just increase the size of the um, output activations and uh, oops, I don't have name here. Um, yeah, so we, we can do it locally using our text editor. Oh, okay. Um, let me do that. Uh, Angshu, meanwhile, do you want to answer the question in the Q and A? So I'll say, why is uh, the output buffers access to PR? Aha. Oh, that's because you're doing a read modify write to the output buffer. Now remember, this is kind of a toy architecture. We're not um, we're not doing uh, any uh, you know we're not doing any filtering. We're not keeping a register local to each Mac. So everything's coming from the output buffer. That's why it's two x because of the read modify write. Uh, and I can see another question, is it assuming similar precision for the uh, partial sum? Uh, yes, in this example, it's the, there's no precision difference uh, between, the, um, between the operands and the results. Uh, that's how everything is configured. If you wanna do something more sophisticated, uh, you should be able to. Okay, um, so uh, Puan, sorry, I can't see the bottom half of your screen. So you, you changed it to 1920, right? Uh, sorry, I'm still on this. Okay. Maybe you can talk about something while I'm trying to do this. Okay. All right. Um, so um, what uh, what you'll see the, the moment uh, Juan changes it to 1920 is that uh, well, the first thing that will happen is that the, your mappings have now become illegal, right? Your 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 mappings won't work because the mapping has to map the specific problem. So if if you expand P to 1920 in the problem you'll have to expand P to 1920 in the mappings as well. And uh, so, so hopefully Juan will get to that. Um, and then once, once we do that, you're gonna start seeing some, some more interesting things happening with the, uh, uh, with the, with the results. Um, Maybe Nelly had grabbed the slide and uh, I'll do, finish this and go back to sharing. Okay, all right. So let's, uh, we're sorry about all the, uh, the technical issues we're facing. Uh, some of the, this is new territory for, for everyone. So please, uh, I hope you understand. Okay, so uh, let's move on to exercise two, right? And what we're doing with exercise two is we're, we're keeping the architecture the same uh, but we're introducing an additional dimension to the, uh, the problem shape. And so we can fast forward through this, Nelly. Uh, there's, oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, it's just an extension of what we've spoken about so far. Uh, we just add that additional dimension. Next slide. And now to represent the mappings, we're gonna start doing something more interesting. So far, all of the mappings we've looked at have been put unquote untiled mappings. Uh, we're gonna try some tiling here. And what I mean by tiling is that if you look at the bottom uh, mapping, the K dimension is now split into two levels. You've got a, uh, a K loop in the inner buffer level, as well as in the outer, uh, in the outer level, right? And that, that's, that's basically classic tiling. Uh, but notice that both of these are essentially output stationary, right? You, because the innermost loop is R. As you go over R, uh, you're, you're changing weights, but you're not changing outputs. Therefore, they're both output stationary, uh, except one is tiled, the other is untiled. And to represent uh, tiled mappings, there, it's no different in, in time loop. It's just you, you, you represent the factors of the loop nest and the permutations, and that's it. Okay, uh, next slide. All right, um, well, let's ping Puan real quickly. Is, uh, yep, I can, I will share the screen and I will be able to edit things now. All right. Um, let me grab that one. Okay, so I'm still at um, your previous one. Do you want to? 
So the previous one is fine because there's something important that I want to illustrate that. So open up prob um, and then uh, change change p to 1920 in prob and both. Uh, Sorry, say that again, p to. Yeah, 400 is fine, I guess. Um, p, you change p to 400 in, uh, yes. okay, change it to 400 in the two mappings as well. In the two uh, maps, uh, map slash. Okay. You sh if you're just changing a number, you should just be able to run sad. Um, I am changing that in another window, so people won't be able to see it. Oh, I see. I see. Okay, if, if this is non-scalable, then maybe we shouldn't try to do it and just ask um, if uh, people are having any problems doing that. Is that actually, I, I, actually what, what are you asking him to do? Change the 400 to another number? No, the 400 is fine. I'm asking him to change map slash ws dot map. I, Yep, I'm done with that. Okay. Okay, right. and, and, and the OS as well, right? Okay, excellent. Now let's rerun the, the OS mapping. Uh, so, 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 so maybe it's a little hard to follow. Tell yep. people what, what changed. Okay, so what we've done is we've basically changed the size of the problem, right? We've changed it from a, a three by 16 problem with three weights and, uh, and uh, 16 output activations to three weights and 400 output activations. It's just a, a, a larger tensor. But to match that larger tensor, we have to change the mappings as well. Uh, otherwise your mapping is not solving the complete problem and time loop is going to complain that your mapping doesn't cover the complete problem. Okay, so we now, we just, um, uh, sorry, did you run uh, WS or OS? You, you run WS, okay. Yes. But try running OS. Okay, so what you see is that OS worked, but WS did not work. Why is that? And the reason has to do with, um, if you think about the mapping, the, uh, the output stationary mapping, it brings in an output of size one, an input window of size three, which is the size of the filter, and a weight window of size three. And it's always three plus three plus one, no matter how large the output, uh, the output dimension is. And so and we scaled the output dimension to a very large number, but the tiling didn't have to change. Uh, it, the tiling in the buffer didn't have to change and it was still a legal mapping. Whereas with weight stationary, what you needed, if you remember the table was one weight, P inputs and P outputs. And because P, because we increased P, that entire P plus P plus one tile, which is 400 plus 400 plus one, which is 801, doesn't fit in the buffer. And that's exactly what you see in the error message. Couldn't map buffer, map tile size A to one exceeds buffer capacity. Okay. And, uh, and so what that means is now we're gonna have to change the architecture. So uh, Juan, uh, in the architecture, can you, uh, yep. Can you change uh, the depth of the buffer from 64 to A to one? And you're never gonna build an 801 size register file, but this is a toy example. 801. Yeah. Okay. Okay, now rerun the weight stationary mapping. Okay. Now rerun the output stationary mapping. You just ran it before. Oh, no. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, right. That makes sense. Okay. So now what you'll see is that uh, to, to support the weight stationary mapping, you had to increase the buffer size significantly. And that led to um, an, a commensurate increase in your picojoules per Mac. 
Now, if you run the output stationary mapping in uh, with the same architecture, you're going to get the same answer because, as we argued, there, there's really no difference uh, 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 for this example. But for the output stationary mapping, you could actually support that mapping with a much smaller buffer size. And with that buffer size, you were getting a much better energy efficiency, right? And so there's this interesting inter interplay between um, data flow, and data flow is basically just a mapping without the loop bound specified. Uh, so there's an interesting interplay between the data flow and the architecture. So depending on the set of data flow choices that you want to support in your architecture, the, 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 the size of the buffers that you provision uh, may be different, right? And therefore, the, uh, the overall energy efficiency of your architecture may be different. So, so it's this sort of trade-off space that we're trying to uh, support exploring uh, with these tools. Okay, uh, now let's jump ahead to uh, uh, exercise two. Um, Puan, I don't think we'll, um, I don't think we'll, we'll need to run this, um, but the, uh, the idea is, you know, you can run uh, this for yourself. You can run both the, um, the tiled and the untiled mappings. And you can see that there's now actually, even with the same architecture, there's a difference in the energy efficiency between the tiled uh, and the untiled mappings. And that's because the amount of data movement is different. The reuse patterns are different. Okay, so that, that's where things uh, uh, actually start kicking into gear. All right, so um, uh, Nelly, can we get back to the slides? Okay, um, so what this slide is trying to show is that, you know, we covered tiled versus untiled, even with the simple example, right? Simple architecture and simple uh, workload. And even sticking to the subset of output stationary data flows, we just showed two, two examples in the, uh, uh, in the exercise, but there's actually an entire family of output stationary uh, data flows. Uh, and so that, that's what this slide is trying to capture. Uh, in fact, the untiled variant was captured by this loopness. So this mathematical expression is nothing but a loopness, right? You, you've got R in the innermost loop, P in the intermediate loop, and K in the outermost loop. Um, so, uh, and so these tables, just like the tables in the prior exercise, they're trying to show what is the algorithmic minimum number of main memory accesses, what is the actual number of main memory accesses you'll get, and what is the, uh, the occupancy of the buffer or the tile size uh, for each of these mappings. And, and like I said, there's an entire family of them. And then you can just scroll through the one more. Yeah, that's it. And, and so the tiled and the untiled are just two examples within this family, right? And so, so, uh, uh, so, 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 so when you think of data flows, uh, uh, a point that's important to understand is that um, it's hierarchical, right? So output stationary describes the behavior at the innermost level. Uh, and all of these are output stationary because the R is the innermost loop, but then you've got uh, loops above that and uh, they also affect what's happening and what is the, uh, what is the efficiency um, of your mapping. Okay, let's move on. Um, Exercise three, um, this is just adding even more sophistication. Let's uh, uh, click, Nali, could you click? Yeah, but this is introducing one more interesting attribute, which is bypassing. Uh, perhaps you decided that, you know what? I don't want to store every tensor at every buffer. It's wasteful to do so. And so I want to be able to bypass certain tensors. So for example, in this example, I'm saying, um, at the global buffer, I just want to keep weights and inputs, and at the register file, I just want to keep outputs. Uh, you can tell time loop to do that as part of the mapping spec uh, by using this bypass directive. And so keep tells you what, uh, what tensors you want to keep, and bypass tells you what tensors you don't want to keep at each level. And by default, if you don't specify anything, uh, the tensors are kept at that level. Uh, but you can override that and ask things to be bypassed. Uh, so this behavior is for time loop model. Time loop mapper, if you don't specify something, it's actually, actually going to explore uh, all combinations. Okay, let's move on. Um, 
let's skip through this. This is, we've covered this in the, uh, um, in the lecture. And then you can, um, you can experiment with this in your free time. And then the, ne the, the next exercise is just a, a further, a more sophisticated version of that, which introduces uh, spatial instances. Uh, you, you just stamp out multiple PEs. Um, okay, uh, let's move on. Um, so to map to uh, an architecture like that, you're gonna have to introduce another level in your loop nest. And specifically, this level is called a spatial four. Uh, and what this covers is the, so remember what the, all, the, all the regular fours covered, right? They, they were trying to capture data movement, uh, but basically though, if you think about the operation space, right? That, that rectangle or that hyper rectangle that represented the space of operations, uh, what these loop nests are doing is they're, they're j just slicing them up, right? It's slicing up the operation space into tiles and it's fetching those tiles in a particular order between buffer levels. Um, now, for, um, for, for, for a spatial level, what you're doing is basically distributing those tiles across space, right? So it's still a loop nest, uh, but, you're, uh, uh, but you have to tag it with a spatial four. Okay, and let me click uh, the, um, the, the way to express this in, in, in YAML is exactly identical to a temporal loop, except you just introduce, uh, introduce the, change the type to spatial. Uh, please go through the video lecture if you haven't already. There are a few other nuances about this that I covered there that I'm not covering today. Okay, let's move on. So there was uh, a question, Anshu. Yep. Um, can this also be extended for heterogeneous architectures? Um, heterogeneous architectures. I am not sure. Uh, yeah, I think I think we. Yeah, maybe maybe the questioner can elaborate what they mean by heterogeneous. Yep. Uh, let's move on. In, in the meantime, if you can elaborate, we'll, we'll pick it up again later. Okay, uh, once again, please follow the directions in the README and shoot us questions if you have any, uh, any issues. Uh, okay, let's uh, move on. I already spoke about this. So the, the, what, what, what we're getting to is basically a, a point where you're having to decide uh, what sort of uh, loop bounds you want at each level, what sort of tilings you want at each level, and as we introduce, as we extend the complexity of problems in architectures, the, the complexity is going to just become uh, unmanageable. And uh, that's kind of why time loops mapper exists. So you don't have to do this. It's the mapper's job to find these mappings for you. Okay, uh, next slide. All right. Um, so to this to invoke the mapper, you still need to give it the problem and the architecture spec, but unlike a mapping, you're gonna give it a set of mapper parameters and a set of constraints. Um, next slide. Um, so the exercise uh, to deal with them, to, to understand the mapper is exercise five, and it goes back to a simpler um, uh, architecture. We don't wanna deal with spatial uh, levels yet. And, um, and so, uh, what, one of the things we want to cover now is, is constraints, right? Describing maps, uh, describing map space and architecture constraints. Uh, so remember that a mapping was basically the stack of uh, uh, directives that, that captured the loop nest. What the mapper does, if you click Nelly, um, is it, it constructs a mapping template and it tries to fill in this template. If, could you click again? Um, so unlike the programmer uh, filling these in, the mapper now tries to fill these in and it tries to come up with all of the combinations of factors, permutations, and ways to bypass things. Um, next. next. Um, now, what you can do as a user though is constrain some of these values. And these constraints are of two types, architecture constraints and map space constraints. And these are described in the example. If you walk through them, you'll see what, uh, what what they're uh, what they try to accomplish. Architecture con constraints try to uh, describe inflexibilities in the hardware, right? So some things happen to be baked in the hardware, and that's what uh, that that's what is covered by them. Map space constraints are um, expert user directives, if you will. So despite having architecture constraints, your map your map spaces end up being fairly large, which means the search heuristics can take a, a fairly large amount of time to search through them. If as a user, you know, hey, you know what? I have enough experience to know 
that this permutation is a bad idea or that I really want to go up with stationary here. I know based on my experience that that's a good idea. Uh, you can frame those as map space constraints and that shrinks the search space for the search heuristic, uh, which makes it run faster and it increases the probability of finding the optimal solution. Okay. Um, so in the exercise, we've provided three alternative sets of constraints. Uh, one mapping is a very interesting set of constraints that really constrains the map space to the point where only one legal mapping is, is uh, valid. And in fact, the architecture and the problem is identical to exercise three. And that legal mapping uh, uh, that comes out of this is actually identical to the mapping uh, we expressed in exercise three, right? And so you'll see that if you run this, um, free bypass is just, you know, we, we turn down the, the, uh, the knob a little bit on the constraints and we relax the bypassing. Uh, and we say, hey, look, Mr. Mapper, find, try to find the best bypass for me. I'm not gonna describe the bypass. And you'll see that even by relaxing the bypass constraints, there's 64 choices of mappings, right? And so an interesting exercise would be, well, we, we provided a, 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 a specific mapping for exercise three, can you, using your intuition, try to come up with a better mapping, a more efficient mapping? And then you run time loop mapper and then see if time loop mapper comes up with an even better mapping and see if you can match time loop ma uh, mapper's optimal mapping. Um, and then null is a fully unconstrained map space in which even the factors and the permutations are unconstrained. So if you run this, you'll see that it takes a little bit longer to run because it's searching through a larger map space. And then see if the mapping you, you come out as a result of that is even better than what you got with free bypass. Okay. Um, and exercise six is where we really blow things up. Unfortunately, we I won't have time to cover this uh, in today's ex, uh, in today's session. Uh, but it's um, it's basically mapping an entire convolutional uh, layer. And well, one of the things you'll see on this slide, and all of these slides and, uh, is, is, are going to be available, the video is also available uh, for you to watch later, uh, is the sum of products form for the input projections, which is now bringing in the H dilation, uh, W dilation, H stride and W stride. Um, okay, so let's move on from the problem spec. Uh, the architecture spec is actually uh, iris, and, um, and, and it's a fairly comprehensive architecture spec, so it's a lot more detailed than all of the toy examples we covered so far. Okay, um, let's move on. We don't need to talk about this. Uh, let's move on. I'll, 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 all of this is covered in the video, so please go ahead and watch it. These, this talks about uh, tuning the, the, the mapper search heuristic, what are all the parameters you have, what are all the termination conditions, etc. Um, I am going to end uh, the, the presentation here um, and uh, move on to Accelergy. Uh, we've already consumed a bunch of Accelergy's time, um, but we'll post these slides and, uh, and if you have any questions offline, please feel free to email us. Thank you, Nelly, for running this for me. No problem. Okay. I'll uh, there are a couple of um, timeless specific questions. Maybe Anju oh, yeah. will like sure. answer them uh, and moment before when, well, while Nelly is preparing her slides. Yeah. So uh, the question about heterogeneous architecture: uh, if the P's in a iris-like architecture have different specifications, that's what. Uh, okay, that's a, that's a very uh, sorry. Uh, you can still hear me, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's a very uh, interesting question. Um, the way you would, so the, the, the immediate answer is no, right? The, the assumption is that um, if you use uh, the vector notation to expand out a set of uh, E's, it's assumed that all of them are homogeneous. If you want to do something heterogeneous, you're going to have to create it as a different level of the, of the tree. Uh, and so you can describe um, a set of PEs that um, correspond to, you know, one set of heterogeneous PEs, and then you describe another block of PEs, which is the, um, which is the other set of heterogeneous PEs. But there's some, you're going to have to play some tricks with bypassing to make sure that uh, it, the, the infrastructure is modeling 
uh, what it is you wanted to model. So honestly, this is not something that we had uh, we had considered before. Uh, if you think there's that th this represents a really uh, interesting and important use case, uh, then we should talk and we should come up with a way to um, either use the existing features to um, kind of approximate and uh, approximately model it or provide native support for that. Okay, uh, I can see the other questions as well. Okay, um, I will let you answer. Yeah, is the problem specification dynamic enough to do other operations like pooling? If you can describe uh, anything as a loop nest, um, uh, as a single loop nest, and the indexing expressions uh, in this SOP form, then you can describe it, right? So, uh, so th that's that's basically the uh, how the problem specification works. Uh, so, pooling, I think, is 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 doable. Um, but uh, let's. Uh, it may be best to to work on it offline and uh, uh, and think about it. But I think pooling should be easily doable. Okay, um, what, uh, what is it? Oh, uh, can you model sparse operations? Okay, that's a, that's a really good question. And, and it is something that we want to be able to do. Uh, right now, the, it supports uh, dense problems only, uh, but, it, but it is something that's very, that's a very, very high importance on our radar and you should stay tuned for, uh, 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 you, you should stay tuned for, for that. Okay, um, uh, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. So does it allow for exploring data flow specifications related to spatial reuse, uh, partial sum data movements? Absolutely, that's, uh, that's really part of what, uh, you know, the, the spatial reuse is a big part of what uh, these accelerators are, um, where these accelerators achieve their efficiency. And, uh, and so it's, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's natively supported. Um, okay. I think that's it. We can, uh, there's a few other questions. We can take those. Uh, the the next one seems to be more Excelogy related. So we'll let Nelly talk and then she can pick it up. Yep. Okay. Uh, I'll share my screen. Okay, so I'm going to go into the second part of these exercises, which are more related to the Axology part. Um, a brief introduction to Axology, if you haven't uh, watched the introduction videos uh, recorded. So uh, basically, accelerators are very popular nowadays to solve these data and computation intensive applications. And it is important for us to have a quick way to evaluate such accelerators in this large and diverse design space. So um, here we show uh, several steps that are involved to develop a potential design, which goes from an architectural blueprint to a finally physical a fabricated physical system. So in order to evaluate every potential design very quickly, we would like to perform the energy evaluation at the architecture stage with uh, architectural level energy estimators. So architectural level energy estimates are performed relatively fast uh, estimations as well as short turnaround time because we'll only explore architectures uh, at a very high level without generating the RTO model and physical layout. So in this case, we're able to generate the most energy efficient design at the architecture stage, which will then be uh, developed all the way to a fabricated system. So Axelergy belongs to this category of architectural level energy estimators, and it is specifically designed for uh, various types of accelerators. Um, so I'm going to go really fast through these slides. So there are actually existing architectural level energy estimators for CPUs and GPUs. Uh, they use fixed architectural level model to represent the architectures. However, since our accelerator designs are very diverse, um, it is hard for us to use the existing tools to map the uh, accelerator designs to a fixed architectural model. So accelerator infrastructure uh, performs the architectural level energy estimation and is able to support the modeling of a very diverse range of architectures with various underlying technologies. Um, so unlike the existing tools, it aims to be flexible enough to support the diversity inside the accelerator design space. And also it tries to improve the energy accuracy, estimation accuracy by allowing 
fine grained classification of various runtime behaviors related to components. So I have a more detailed description of this feature in the recorded videos. If you're interested, you can go ahead and take a look at that section. Um, and also, since a lot of architectures are very complicated, um, we also try to develop a more succinct way for modeling of these complicated designs inside the XRG framework. So at a very high level, I'm going to go into details of each of these um, input files and output files. But at a high level, XLRG takes in the architecture description. It generates, um, it uses external energy estimation plugins for various technologies estimations. And it then generates the energy reference table, which records the energy consumption of the various runtime behaviors associated with each component in the design, as well as the area reference table. And XRG will combine the energy reference table information with uh, what we call an action count input, which records the runtime behaviors of the components running a specific workload. So they combine these information and XRG will be able to generate the energy estimation. So I will show um, a more detailed example in, later in our exercises. And as I have mentioned, when you have very complicated architectures, we also want the architecture description to be succinct. So in this case, XRG accepts user-defined uh, very high-level components in the architecture description, and we call those compound components. XRG also uh, allows the user-defined description of these compound components as an input. So it's able to combine this very succinct architecture description with user-defined compound component description to redefine a design that's very complicated. And the similar process flows where XRG will take the design description, generate the energy reference table, and uh, also generate the energy estimation by combining it with the action count. So now uh, let's dive into the details about how to use XLRG. So the first uh, class of examples will be modeling of simple architectures where we can actually use lower level primitive components or basic building blocks to represent the architecture. So recall the first step of XLRG framework is to perform an energy reference table generation. So here I'm showing a detailed description of an architecture description, uh, which is composed of various primitive components, such as a, a global buffer, a local buffer, and Mac. They are all of uh, basic building blocks, and we, uh, we treat it as an instance of a primitive component class. So in this case, global buffer and local buffer are instances of the SRAN primitive component class. Um, and with the architecture description, XRG is able to uh, parse the architecture, query the estimation plugins, appropriate for the components and generate the energy reference table or area reference table for design. So here we're showing the details of the energy reference table, which basically records the energy per action values for the components in the design. And the action of a component basically is the operation that can be performed by, performed by the component. So um, in uh, just as what Anshu has mentioned, uh, all our system uses YAML-based inputs and produces YAML-based output files. So let's take a look at how these inputs and outputs are uh, represented in YAML format. So first, let's take a look at the primitive component library. Uh, XRG comes with a default primitive component library, and the usage of this library is basically to provide a definition of common used primitive component classes. So for example, here we're showing a bitwise operator and the integer adder. Of course, there are more components involved such as SRAM, reservoir file, uh, modifier, et cetera. So what does a uh, primitive component library define? The first important uh, thing that it defines is the necessary hardware attributes for defining each primitive component. So in this case, we can see that uh, for a bitwise component, we would like to know first the technology of the component and as well as the data width of the component. Um, and as we have mentioned, all of these attribute names are user defined. So you can, for your component, define the name of the associated attributes. Um, and here we're specifying the default values of these attributes. And similarly, this happens to the other, which uh, has a number of pipeline stages attributes uh, available to use. 
And the second uh, important category that we want to define is the associated actions for each of these parental component class. So as you can see here, um, basically we use the actions keyword in this YAML file and we list the necessary actions that are associated with each component. Um, for example, our adder will perform the add action, which is very intuitive. Um, as I have mentioned, XRG does come with a set of premium component class by default. So once you install XRG, it will come with a set of commonly used premium components. But you can also add your own premium component classes uh, by modifying the config file of XRG, which I'll talk about later in detail. Uh, with this functionality, if you have a design that's very different from uh, conventional digital design, for example, if you have a memory store or DRAM-based memory cell uh, print component unit, then uh, you can actually add it to this print component library for XLRG to be able to understand its definition. Um, and we also have the definition of actions with arguments. So recall that in the recorded video, we have shown that if we find, we classify the actions of the component in a fine granularity, we actually can have a more accurate energy estimation of the component. And, and here we're just as a reminder for the access to a register file, if we classify it into various types of fine grain actions, we actually have a five X difference between these fine grain actions. So how do we represent these actions? It would be really tedious if we just want to list all of them, um, especially for components that has a lot of fine grain actions. So in this case, we introduce what we call arguments of an action. Um, so recall, I, uh, Repeat, a repeated read means we're consecutively reading the same address of this uh, and the same data out of the memory storage unit. So in this case, this repeated read is uh, actually a read action. And the amount of data delta and address delta, so data delta means how much does your data wire switch and address delta means how much does your address delta wire switch. So in this case, if we have a repeated rate, that means we are not switching any of the data wires as well as the address wires. So all of those uh, stay zero. And similarly, we can derive the argument values for the other act, fine grain actions that's associated with this component. Um, so inside our premium component library, we can actually specify them in terms of arguments of the action and we can specify the range of the arguments. So now we have described uh, at a high level, what does the premium component look like inside XLRG? Next, let's take a look at the architecture description. Um, so architecture description needs to describe three important factors, the hierarchical relationships between components, uh, the component classes of each component and the hardware attributes associated with each component. So here, um, as we have described earlier in the time loop tutorial as well, all of the architectures are described as an architectural tree. So first we will have uh, the parts of the tree where it's not the uh, leaves of the tree. So we describe it using a keyword subtree and you can see here um, the design and the PE are um, intermediate levels with the subtree keyword and name defined. And we also have the leaves of tray, which will be the actual comp power components involved in the design. And we use the keyword local to uh, describe these components. So these local components will be actual hardware instantiations of your components in your architecture. And more importantly, we also want to let the user or let Accelerate know that um, what the, are the classes of these local or actual hardware instantiations. So we use the keyword class to define uh, what are the classes for each of these components. And furthermore, we do want to specify the hardware attributes that are associated with each component. Um, and it, as you can see here, all of these components are actually 45 nanometer components. Therefore, we allow the specification of a global attribute um, inside the subtree. So basically here we're specifying attribute technology is 45 nanometer for all of the component in the design. So this attribute will be propagated down to um, the leaves and other nodes in the tree. And uh, very apparently we are able to specify the attributes using the attribute keyword. So now uh, we have also got an understanding of the architecture description. Uh, 
in the YAML format. And um, one thing I want to mention is, as you can see here, we have um, a top level key uh, for each file. And it, these keys are used for Accelerology as well as time loop to identify what type uh, this file is. Uh, so you don't, there is basically no order in terms of which file you input. Uh, each file will be automatically identified by the tools. Um, and we have also the output the energy reference table. So the energy reference table, as I have mentioned, uh, lists the energy consumption energy consumption of each action associated with the component. And uh, to be simple, we in this energy reference table, all of the components are listed in a flattened format. So as you can see here, uh, we can see the hierarchy of the architecture via the name of the component um, instead of having a hierarchical tree. So this allows the file to be shorter and easier to parse by the user as it is an output. Um, and also, since we need to describe the energy per action values associated with each component, uh, we have the actions keyword for specifying each action. And if your action do not have an argument, it will show as a null. And the energy keyword is for specifying the actual energy value. Um, and on the other hand, as we have mentioned, if we have arguments for uh, this action, for example, if we have arguments for the rate, one is zero, zero, that means we have a repeated rate, we do need to specify in the, uh, or Axology does output um, one entry for each possible combination of your argument value. So in this case, you can see um, it outputs the, zero, zero, combination, zero, one, and et cetera, and all the way until one, one. Uh, so then we are able to see in the ERT what are the energy consumption of these fine grain actions. So this introduced the high level idea uh, of what the ERT will look like in our YAML format. So then we can actually have a toy example to see uh, how these uh, command will play uh, in runtime. So I assume this is showing up, the terminal? Yes. Okay, um, so here we're showing the exercises for Axology and um, let's go to the first ex exercise. Uh, so you can see that we have the input output uh, and reference output folders and inside the input folder, we're providing only the architecture. Remember our architecture describes the components um, and their component classes. So we can actually have a, uh, have a very brief look at the architecture file. So as you can see here, um, we have the name of the architecture and the subtree and local components that are involved uh, in this architecture. So let's try to run. So basically the way to run Accelerate is you do Accelerate and then you give it the input uh, folder which contains all the input files that you're interested in. Um, and we can send this to the output folder. Um, so I'm going to briefly talk about these logs. Um, so you can see um, it's showing up what file it identifies and what it is parsing. So it, it see basically by default, there are three different types of preview component files come with XRG. So you can see uh, saying oh, I'm parsing some preview component files uh, and this the relative path of these files. And there's also showing what energy estimation plugin is identifying. So you can, um, from this, Lock, we can see the Kai estimator, the Latin estimator, and there is also the table based estimator that will, I'll discuss later, is identified by Axology. So if you add your own estimation plugin, um, your estimation plugin name will show up uh, in the log. Um, and you can see some of the estimations are queried during the run of this Axology call. So we can um, also see what outputs are, pro are, are provided by Axology. You can the most important one will be the energy reference table that records the energy per action values for the actions uh, of the components. So we can briefly take a look at uh, the ERT. So it's actually a pretty long file where you can uh, basically see the name of the components, which is in a flattened form, and all of these actions related to this component for the actions that has arguments, uh, the ERT will list the associated actions and associated argument values and the energy related to this uh, argument. So you probably uh, have already realized it's 
really a long file, kind of got a summarized version of the ERT just for easy access of the energy data. So there is actually also the ERT summary file and it's uh, in a more succinct way. So you can uh, see from this file, first it provides the energy act, uh, per action values. It also provides you which um, energy estimation plugin is used for the estimation of a particular component. And as you recall, the buffer actually had a very long list of energy values in the ERT, but here the energy, the ERT summary file only summarizes the max mean and average values for each action that has uh, associated arguments. So in this case, uh, if you do want to have a high level understanding of what the ERT looks like, uh, you can definitely just look at the ERT summary to get a sense. Uh, so this basically gives us a quick um, understanding of what Axology does for generating energy reference table. And the second step is taking the energy reference table and a action class which re records the runtime behaviors of the components by recording the number of times each action has occurred to generate the energy estimation. So in this case, I'm going to briefly talk about what the action counts look like. This is an example action counts, and it has a very similar structure as the architecture. However, it does record uh, for each action associated with a component how many times it has occurred during a run of the specific workload. And notice that here, in order for the action counts and ERT uh, to work together to generate an energy estimation, the action names and the arguments associated with this action has to match. So uh, this is this goes back to the fact about which act similar can be connected to axology. Um, so this basically answers the question as long as the runtime behaviors uh, generated by your performance model can come in the form of uh, what is described here inside the action counts, uh, we are able to take in your similar results and perform the energy estimation. Uh, so that's the only thing. Nelly, there's a quick question. Um, the, one of the questions is just to confirm, these actions refer to events on the actual simulation of the accelerator. Right, that is correct. So all these action counts are recorded during the simulation uh, of your architecture running specific workload. Okay, okay. another one is um, that seems relevant now. Uh, where do you define the units of energy and area? Um, so the, the unit of the energy area is actually defined in the estimation plugin. In our case, the open source plugin uh, defined the unit as pickle joules for energy and micrometer squared for, for area. But if you have another plugin that produces a different unit, uh, you probably need to make sure there is some uniformity across the plugins that you use for the estimation. Uh, and of course, in the future, we're planning to make sure uh, at the XRG side, that we have a better interpretation of the unit of the energy and area that's uh, accepted from the plugins. Okay, um, so, so this is the action counts, which is a very important interface between the simulator that you use to simulate your architecture and the XRG energy estimation tool. Um, so again, in this step, we will have the energy reference table taken in by axology as well as the action counts. So you can uh, run an axology estimation with the energy reference table input action counts input. So this actually allows a very quickly iterations through the various simulations that you run in the simulator because you don't, I, uh, you you will have the same energy reference table for the architecture you're simulating. Uh, and for different workloads, you will get different action counts. So due to time limit, I'm not going to uh, run this exercise, but you can definitely try out yourself by uh, basically sending the ERT and action counts to Axology and let it perform the energy calculation part uh, of the tool. So the second, uh, the second part I want to introduce is the modeling of a complicated architecture. Um, so as you have seen in the previous example, we're using very basic building blocks to define the architecture. But in many cases, um, our architecture is very complicated and involves a lot of basic building blocks. So if we still use the basic building blocks to define either the architecture or the runtime behavior of the architecture, um, things will become very tedious. 
So I have other uh, very detailed explanation in the recorded video. So if you're interested, you can take a look. So basically the solution from the accelerate side is we allow architecture description in terms of higher level components, which we call compound components. And we also allow the definition of the compound components to be sent in via compound component description. So in this way, no matter uh, what uh, design specific component you are using inside your architecture, you are still able to let Axology understand by providing the compound component description. So in this case, we are using a smart buffer for the storage units and a Mac with a FIFO for the actual compute unit. Um, and we are uh, sending the description of these design specific components into Axology. Um, so again, these inputs are described in terms of YAML files. Uh, very quickly, now we have an architecture that uses uh, user-defined compound component classes, which are smart buffer and Mac FIFO. And uh, in order to define a compound component, there are two important steps. First is we want to describe the actual hardware implementation of these compound components. Um, very quickly, we have the smart buffer unit where um, it has two address generators for generating the address sequences and a buffer storage for storing data. So in order to define this compound component, uh, we, we define it using uh, a keyword called subcomponents, which specifies what are the basic building blocks that are involved in this compound component. Um, and as you can see here for the smart buffer component, we have two lower level subcomponents. Um, the next thing we want to define is uh, the attributes associated with this compound component class. Um, so again, we have technology with and that for the smart buffer. Um, also, we do want to project the hardware attributes of the compound component down to its subcomponents because we want to define the subcomponents, which will be used for uh, for sending to external energy plugin and perform energy estimation. So in this case, at a high level for a smart buffer, we'll have the width and depth of it. So how can we use this high level attributes to define um, the lower level components? So for the address generator, you can see that we're doing a projection of the technology because they definitely are of the same technology uh, with a global buffer. And uh, for the data width of address generator, we're performing a uh, arithmetic computation between uh, of the uh, high level attributes that are associated with this compound component class. So here, uh, basically we're showing how is this reflected inside the YAML file where we, uh, we have both the attribute mapping happening between technology and um, the arithmetic computation happening, which can be understood by the XRG parser. So in this way, we are defining a design specific compound component class in, in terms of the uh, primitive components that can be understood by XRG. So as you can see here, the class of the address generators are a primitive component class, which is an adder, and the buffer is of SRAM class. So the second step is to define the compound actions associated with um, this compound component class. Uh, so again, this is a two level tree definition. So for example, if we have a read action of the smart buffer that can be composed of a generation of the read address, which corresponds to an add action of the address generator and a actual read into the storage buffer. So how do we represent this in the YAML? So here I'm showing uh, we have smart buffer class. We use the actions keyword to define compound component related actions. Um, and again, we're using argument uh, mapping between the high level compound action and its sub actions. So uh, again, for sub components, we mean components that are uh, uh, that, that belongs to this compound component classes. And for the read action, we actually have two related sub actions of the sub components in the class. So this gives us a high level uh, description of how we can describe a, a compound component class smart buffer. Um, so basically with this definition, we can then send both the architecture and the smart buffer inputs to Axology, which will then uh, parse the design description 
with the Kanban component de definition and generate the energy area reference table, which will then be used to perform energy estimations. Uh, so there is an exercise inside the Docker for uh, trying out this, but uh, due to time limit, I'm not going to go through, but feel free to try it yourself. Um, and we also provide a Iris like architecture uh, description inside that tutorial, which has a, a much more complicated architecture that involves various Kanban components, um, which uh, will be parsed and then sued by Accelerogy. So you can also feel free to try out that. And during the run of this exercise, you probably will realize it takes longer than the previous exercises because your architecture are more complicated and you have more compound component involved in your architecture. Sorry, there's a quick question, Nelly. Um, uh, why is the address generator considered an adder? Uh, so it's just a simplification of the modeling. Uh, basically, the generation of the address probably is uh, the addition of some offset according to your application logic. So we basically model it as an adder. But if you have a more complicated control logic, you can definitely model it as a more complicated component. Okay, and uh, I'm going to quickly talk about, so a lot of people are interested in how the energy estimation plugin work and how can we have our own energy estimation plugin for a different underlying technology. So here, um, uh, basically the energy estimation plugins are automatically located by Axelergy according to the Axelergy config file. So if you go into our Docker or in your system, you can find the config file of Axelergy uh, at this at uh, this specific path. And you can see that is, uh, it's a default version where it's automatically generated by your first run of Axelergy. It specifies um, the default energy estimation plugins path, as well as the default premium component libraries path. So uh, if you take a look at these paths, you can see the default plugins that are installed uh, inside here. So by looking at this config file, Xrg is able to automatically locate all these plugins. And if you have your new plugin, you can basically supplement uh, this list of possible paths. Um, and how do the plugins Xrg um, interact? So basically, Xrg sends um, requests to these plugins to check whether a specific component can be supported by the plugin. And uh, as a first step, all of these plugins will check whether they support the component and send back an estimation accuracy that uh, it, uh, it can produce for the component. So if it's not supporting a specific component, it will just send back zero to XRG. And then XRG will pick the most accurate plugin from all the plugins it's able to locate and actually send the estimation request to the plugin. So the plugin will then uh, pr process the request and generate energy estimation uh, for the component. This is, uh, so by dividing this into two steps, we try to avoid the um, estimation overhead from all of these plugins. Um, so if we allow the plugin to perform the estimation directly, it can take a long time for all of these plugins finish. So therefore we only correlate and let the plugins to perform estimation when we see it as the most accurate one. Um, and then, so how about the case where all these open source plugins are not uh, cap capable of supporting uh, our technology? So in this case, XRG actually uh, introduced a table-based plugin for easy plug and check of user-defined CSV tables. So again, the interface between this provided plugin and XRG is already set up. And what we do is um, in, for the table-based plugin, we already provide a default set of CSV tables for you to use as a template to generate your own set of tables. And what the table-based plugin does is it searches all of the tables it can see and pick the most uh, relevant table to perform the, the estimation request received from Axelergy. And uh, one important thing that these set of tables need is it needs an identifier YAML to specify what is my, the name of my set of tables and uh, uh, related technology, etc. So we already provide a default set for you to use as a reference. And users can add your own set of CSV tables. So for example, here we're showing uh, we're using an additional table 
uh, set of table which contains the energy estimation of a MAM register. So you can see here, uh, inside the table was, we are specifying the hardware attributes associated with the component, uh, which action is this row corresponding to and what's the energy uh, of this action. The area obviously keep the same uh, for the same component. So this is a very simple example, uh, CSV table that can be understood by the table-based plugin. So in this way, we can actually uh, plug, uh, we can actually let uh, the users create various type of tables that are related to different types of underlying technologies. Uh, so for example, if you have a DRAM-based processing memory technology table, then you can uh, create your own set of table as well as for FPGA components. Um, the XRG table-based plugin will be able to see uh, all these tables via, again, the XRG config file. Uh, so in this case, let's ignore the estimation plugin and print components. There is another entry in the config file where it specifies the roots of all of the, the tables that you want XRG to see. So in this case, uh, we, uh, we tell XRG that you, you probably want to take a look at my PIM related CSV files and FPGA related CSV files to perform uh, an accurate estimation of my architecture. Um, so we actually provide some command to, to allow easier addition of these routes. So you basically can run the XRG tables command to, with a dash R flag to add your, uh, your new routes that are related to your own set of CSV tables. Um, so we actually also have an exercise that uh, basically performs a modeling of processing memory architecture where um, it's necessary for us to add another set of tables to XLRG, which records the necessary energy estimations for the components that are uh, popular in processing memory-based design. Um, so there are instructions in the readme for you to, to basically follow how to add your own set of tables, and you can also see what the tables look like for the processing memory-based design. So due to time limitation, I'm going to leave the exercise to you to perform. As, so if you have any questions, you can definitely reach out to us about that. Um, there are also other exercises in the tutorial where we can uh, explore the Time Loop Plus XRG system. Um, we provide a various popular designs. So for example, Iris, we also provide Simba, which is uh, Multi it is a way stationary NVDA style um, architecture. And we also provide some example workload specification that you can send into Time Loop Plus XRG, such as VGG, uh, AlexNet, et cetera. So feel free to explore the Docker for more access to this with Time Loop and XRG, and um, feel free to reach out to us with any questions. Uh, so I think we're right on time. <laughs> Uh, and if there are okay, any well, let's take a, a couple. I yeah. think we can take a couple questions. Some are very quick. Yeah. Um, do you get the action counts from the next kernel cycle like you're at simulator? Yes. So yes, we get action counts from external performance model, and in the system, we uh, we use time loop as the performance model. Okay. Um, maybe this became clear. Uh, do you also have an area model in addition to performance and energy? Yes, uh, it, if you look at the plugins, it does perform. So we also have the ART output that uh, gener that's generated by XRG and records the area consumption of each component. So take a look at the exercises, you will be able to see the ART output. And then can XLRG estimate energy and performance for analog PIM designs? Again, I think this- Yeah, so take, definitely take a look at the, uh, the fifth design as well as the baseline designs. It's, it's used for, definitely the memory surface processing memory analog computation architectures. And we also have a paper that uh, describes our modeling of uh, processing memory based architecture. So definitely check out the exercises on our paper. Okay. Uh, there's another question. Have you compared um, uh, the system with Gem5 Aladdin? What's the pros and cons compared with Gem5 Aladdin? Uh, so we haven't really compared to Gem5 Aladdin. 
we we have only compared our estimation uh, methodology with our Latin estimation methodology, and the conclusion we come to is basically we are able to achieve higher estimation accuracy while define green classification of the different components. Um, so, so we haven't really have a very comprehensive comparison with the Gen 5 plus L11 system. Okay, and then uh, there's one more that's Excelogy related. If, if, Iris, if, if Iris is implemented with Excelogy, can the MAC operations of each PE be tracked in a specific cycle? Uh, yeah, it's yeah, so that, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. that's more related to the performance modeling part of the uh, Iris architecture. So at the Axology side, definitely we're able to uh, generate an energy reference table for all of these possible MAC operations that happen. So if you have a zero data, then uh, your MAC is basically gated according to Iris optimization. And it's really up to uh, the simulator uh, to determine whether I want to simulate the MAC operation for each cycle. If it does, then we are able to generate a very accurate estimation with the ERT, just as what we propose in the SCCAD paper, where we're able to achieve very high accuracy. Uh, but if your performance model is not able to capture cycle level information of your architecture, then the answer will be no, because um, you know it's a very similar dependent uh, question. For an estimation. Okay, there's another question. What's the uh, what's the difference between Accelergy and Scale Sim? Uh, scale Sim is is both a performance model uh, with some energy estimation, uh, which is not as flexible as what we can model inside Accelergy. Uh, Accelergy focused more on how can we model model the various architecture, not limited to deep neural network accelerators, but all of these different types of accelerators was the flexible methodology for model these architectures, as well as how can we achieve a better interface for performing the energy estimation. So SkillSim is more like an integrated system performing DNN model, accelerator modeling, as well as a fixed uh, energy estimation methodology, but in our case, we are able to, with the help of an external simulator, we are able to perform much more flexible uh, architectural representation and energy estimation. Uh, there's one more Accelergy uh, question. What are the options of performance simulator plugins other than time loop? The que they, he says, uh, I mean, can you use external simulators? Yes, definitely. So the, any any external simulator can be used for Accelergy. Uh, as long as, as I mentioned, the action counts can be generated by the simulator can be understood by Accelergy. So they need to be, they need to, whatever this, it, the, the simulator generates natively, either would be modified or converted to be action counts that Accelergy can Right, have. exactly. Okay, there's a, there's a complicated question for uh, time loop that I'm going to hand over to Anshu. Yeah. Okay. So the question is, regarding time loop and spatial reuse, the spatial four in example four shows mapping data between the global buffer and register file across PEs. Can the spatial four also map to an architecture that uses the PE array connected over an NOC to move data between PEs instead of moving data over a shared memory? If so, how are the specifications for data movement over NOC specified? For example, uh, streaming, multicast, et cetera. Okay, so the answer is um, absolutely. Uh, as I said, this is a very, very important part of how accelerators achieve energy efficiency and it's modeled natively. So in fact, if you go back to the, um, the architecture examples that I showed, um, the uh, a, a NOC instance is actually, a, we call it a network module is explicitly instantiated between every set of buffer levels, right? And there's various pluggable uh, uh, network modules that you can write, but we provide a library of network modules as well. And if you don't describe anything, these network modules get instantiated. Now on the mapper side, when you describe something like a spatial four, the mapper says, okay, this is a spatial four. If I have a spatial four between a global buffer and a set of PEs, then, the tile analysis phase is going to count the amount of data moved 
from the global buffer and to the PEs. And then it's gonna send it over to the microarchitecture model and say, hey, look, I wanna move this much data. What is the cost of moving all of this data? The microarchitecture model then looks at the network submodule and says, hey, Mr. Network, just tell me the cost of moving this data. And then the network says, ah, I am a network that can actually perform a multicast. And whether the data was actually multicastable or not was provided by the tangle analysis to the microarchitecture model. So the microarchitecture model says, oh, yeah, sure, I, I am a network that's actually capable of multicast. Therefore, I will use my multicast capabilities to do it. And then it assigns a cost to do that using multicast. Now, if it so happens that you want to emulate a system that does not have a multicast network, you can plug in a network module that does not support multicast, in which case it will take in the tile analysis data and it'll say, oh, I can't do a multicast. Therefore, I will charge this many uh, serial accesses because I was unable to do that. Okay, that was the end of the questions and we've held people a little bit long. Um, we, would, we would encourage uh, people if they have more questions, um, feel free um, to either re reach out, I'll, I'll volunteer any of the speakers, um, reach out. Um, also the tools and the exercises are all uh, reposit Git repositories on GitHub. Uh, feel free to ask questions and raise issues in the um, in the GitHub repos. Uh, we would appreciate that as well. So, um, want to thank the speech speakers very much, and I guess we're closing down.